Many individuals have been involved in our field from the beginning and have witnessed firsthand its growth and the impact on what we do in training and in education. In this program, we'll be talking with Dr. Ivor Davies, who is a faculty member at Indiana University for over 30 years. Welcome, Dr. Davies. Thank you. I'd like to begin by asking you, what created your interest and motivated you to pursue a career in this field? I didn't start off thinking of having a career <laughs> in the field. Uh, I was trained as a psychologist and had worked for a number of years uh, concerned with co uh, concept acquisition and that was my area of interest in psychology and I was invited here at Indiana University uh, to give a lecture in an international series. Uh, I was in the Indian Ocean doing some work in the Maldives at that time and my wife uh, sent me a telegram saying you've got this invitation and I would accept it if you can. I was in mind not to accept it. <laughs> Having been away, I wanted to get back home. But anyway, I came out here one November and gave a uh, lecture on structure and strategy uh, in Valentine. And as a result of that, they asked me uh, to stay on a few more days. By the way, the funding for the lecture uh, was, in, was coming from the United States government uh, in terms of an interest in community colleges. And um, so I gave the lecture in Valentine, and they asked me to stay on a few more days, which I did. The weather was wonderful, it was an Indian summer, and I went back home. That, as far as I was concerned, was the end of the matter mm -hmm. of both uh, Indiana uh, and um, of talking to people who were in a field which they nervously called instructional development at that time. Then, um, I received a telephone call which was placed by Tom Sharp, uh, sorry, um, uh, Tom Schwen, uh, an early pioneer in our field who was then a graduate student in the program uh, and asked if I would um, be interested in talking uh, to Gene Farris who had then been just appointed as Dean of Learning Resources in Ballantyne. Previous to that he'd been um, uh, 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 um, associate Executive Director in the Audiovisual Center. And I said yes, and Jean asked me if I was interested, perhaps, of thinking of coming here. I said, uh, yeah, I've always had a, an idea that you should never close down on any interview or any job opportunities <laughs> until they got serious. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I said, okay, we'll write to you and uh, then you, you can think about what we're proposing. So he wrote to me, um, and the result of that was I came for what I thought was an interview um, <clears throat> for an appointment in a, the, a new field which had been created here by changing the name of, of a department, which was basically audiovisual, um, to instructional systems technology. That uh, sort of intrigued me, uh, though I saw it very narrowly. Um, so I came here, um, and in the course of the interview, uh, I was very uncomfortable because they seemed to be asking me questions uh, about why I wasn't asking them questions. <laughs> and I suddenly realized that this was not an interview. They had already offered me the job. I was interviewing them to see if I was willing to come, <laughs> which sort of threw things. Anyway, um, towards the end of the afternoon, on the second set of conversations we had, uh, I said that I would be willing to come, uh, because at that time my children were young and I was thinking, I was doing more and more work in the, United, in, in the United States, and it seemed to be a good time if I was ever going to move physically, uh, to move when they were young. Um, and they said, well, when would you be willing to come? I said, well, I couldn't come for two years. Uh, their faces dropped. Uh, they saw that as presenting, you know, enormous problems. Um, and so they said, why? And I said, well, I have a project which I have to complete. And so two years was the first time I'd be able to come. So, they, they, so Jean was asked to take me to see um, the Lilly Library. 
And so they got me out of the room, which was in Bryan Hall in the Dean of Faculty's office. And um, I ultimately came back and they said, well, here's a proposal. We'll appoint you um, as professor uh, with tenure on um, the first day of the new semester in the academic year. And we'll give you leave of absence for two years <laughs> on the next day. <laughs> but we'll pay you a per diem, a, 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 a per diem rate for all the time that you're able to come during the two years. So I arrived, as it were, two, two years late. Uh, Bob Heineck had been the man who proposed the, the name change, Instructional Systems Technology. Ole Larsen uh, was then, um, uh, he had the title from a previous role he had of Dean, Dean Ole Larsen. Uh, he was uh, chairman uh, of, um, of the department. He saw it as being too narrow a definition of the field, uh, but Bog uh, really drove it. He'd been appointed about two years previous, and uh, he'd been appointed again as a, as a senior professor and uh, with a, a, a publishing background. Mm -hmm. And um, so instructional systems technology was what it became. Um, if I can in, interrupt you, I know yes. you, you were involved, I know, at least you have one well-cited article with Jim Hartley on program instruction, so in some ways you had some contact with the field before really instructional design became formulae, form, uh, formal and uh, instructional systems technology. What kind of shift did that indicate when we switched from, well, here it was, I think, audiovisual communications to instructional systems technology? What did we, a, a paradigm shift? What, what kind of, how would you characterize that shift when we picked up this new term? The new term, uh, the, the term instructional design as used within the department, um, which resulted in an article written by Gene Farris, which is really the, the, the most historical article because it's concerned with defining the nature of instructional design and development. Is that the one that was an AB instructor? Yes. Yes. Um, and the department was founded on that article, mm -hmm. or it, it was in their minds. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And Gene Farris wrote it as an article, um, but the, 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 even the coursework reflected the boxes within that linear program. Okay, and that was much richer than just uh, uh, defining things in terms of instructional technology. But I think that the instructional technology piece was driven by a significant change in the technology that the department saw as the future, mm -hmm. which was that film would be only part of the future, mm -hmm. not in fact the mainstay. Mm -hmm. But the film library would fund the change in the department through the use of new technology. And of course part of that new technology was this enormous crea and a, a fantastic creation called the overhead projector. <laughs> um, and the overhead projector really uh, drove that because it surprised, I remember how many people were surprised when someone arrived with an overhead projector and switched it on and the writing on the wall um, uh, but they took them back to the Old Testament and the pharaohs and everywhere <laughs> else. Um, and so, um, and then photography became a much more important part of the field. Um, the design part was what Harvey Fry had always been interested in, even in the days of um, of the old audiovisual department. Mm -hmm. But he took photography and graphics and design and that became an important part of the new department. So that's where the design portion of the program, which mm -hmm. was a master's program for the most part at that time, uh, then came the development of developing materials for that, which was the instruction. Mm -hmm. The technology merely reflected what everybody's saying, isn't this interesting technology, the world's changed, we've got a new industrial revolution. Um, but we never really um, defined ourselves other than using technology um, until the days uh, of um, the foundation, if you like, of Microsoft. Okay. What was your prep, uh, professional preparation for entering the field? Um, so if we define I entered the field on the first day that I came here, before I was given leave of absence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that one day. <laughs> yeah, on that one day. Um, 
I suppose it was that I had just published a book uh, which was called The Management of Learning from McGraw Hill, mm -hmm. um, which about said it all. Uh, I was interested in learning, concepts is a subset of all of that, program learning uh, um, was a something that was implementing that because B.F. Skinner at that time as a psychologist uh, interested me greatly. Mm -hmm. I knew Skinner slightly, personally, mm -hmm. um, both in Europe the time he spent in Europe as well as the time that he uh, was here because um, Skinner was originally uh, chairman of the psychology department here at IU and he went to Harvard uh, where I met him again um, on the Monday after JFK's funeral when Harvard and everywhere else in the United States uh, shut down and I arrived that day for an interview <laughs> with Skinner <laughs> uh, but he still met me <laughs> um, and he's uh, I remember that his office uh, was a room in the football stadium, which rather puzzled me that such a distinguished man would have an office <laughs> in the football stadium, in the, in the basement of the football stadium. Anybody anyway. Uh, and uh, so I think that that really was the start of, of a, an extended interest in what I was really about. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested in how you manage learning, so that m learning uh, uh, takes place. Mm -hmm. And um, looking uh, mentally back at the chapters in that book, I think that they neatly fit um, what the idea was in redefining the field. And I always imagined that uh, Ole Larson had seen uh, the proposal for that book, which is quite possible. Mm -hmm. Heinick might have got it through his publishing contact with <laughs> McGraw Hill, and so that was one of the reasons that I was invited uh, for that international series. Mm -hmm. Okay, you mentioned uh, your, your backgrounds in psychology and uh, your dissertation was on concept learning, concept attainment. Uh, but it was from a psychology standpoint as opposed to as, say an instructional design standpoint at that time. If, if you were directing uh, a student's dissertation today or, or still working with students in instructional design and a student came to you and said I would like to either replicate your study or to act on one of the recommendations you made. Would that still be relevant, a relevant study for research for our field today? Uh, yes, um, because uh, first of all, the instrument of, uh, that I used uh, uh, for my study, uh, which was an experiment uh, with 110 people um, who were technical people, uh, was a program learning text. Uh, because that enabled me, I had no particular uh, interest in, in it other than the fact that the program learning text gave me a standard instrument mm -hmm. that could be used for people in different situations. 110 people is a lot of people to manage. Um, and um, I was interested in answering the question basically of whether concept acquisition was all or none or was incremental. Uh, that argument still exists within the field. Um, because of the, um, I was able to use what we would uh, then call, what we would now call a supercomputer in those days, which was um, an American military, British military um, uh, defense computer uh, for the purpose of the study, because mm -hmm. it was interested in the British government. Um, and so I was able to do extraordinary things uh, in terms of the analysis of the data. Mm -hmm. And we knew everything about the 110 people from their religious status uh, to how many children they had, uh, when they were born, where they were born, uh, their health. And uh, we didn't use all those variables, but I'm simply saying we had enormous data mm -hmm. in terms of the background of those people. And the study uh, became well known only because it was regarded as one of the five best studies in um, comparative um, uh, experimental work because of the design and the analysis. Okay. Uh, what did I find? <laughs> I found that uh, in this particular instance that uh, concept acquisition was all or none. 
that you either got the concept or else you didn't con get the concept. Mm -hmm. If you didn't get the concept, what you got uh, was a knowledge chain. Mm -hmm. um, so often a verbal chain, but it could be a motor chain. Mm -hmm. Uh, but people would still say, I got the concept, but it wasn't a concept, it was a motor chain in using Gagne's mm -hmm. um, terms. Okay. Well, you, you've told us about your dissertation, that um, very interesting and, and so viable today. So let's go back to the time period right after you graduated then. What were your aspirations and uh, uh, your interests when, when you started your first job after your uh, doctorate? Okay, I uh, had been educated in Europe. Uh, I'd been edu in uh, Germany, I'd been educated in the United Kingdom, and I had been educated at the University of Illinois, where I have a master's degree mm -hmm. uh, in psychology. Um, and so my aim always after the, um, my uh, 18 months at, uh, in Havana Champagne was to come back to the United States. Um, I was a uh, um, intrigued uh, of coming back for you know maybe uh, four or five years and then going back to Europe mm -hmm. but I enjoyed uh, what I had done uh, at Abana Champagne. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I chose Abana Champagne I could use any, choose any university uh, in the United States uh, was that there was a British uh, faculty member um, at um, Habana uh, whose, in, whose area was personality and I was at that time particularly interested in personality mm -hmm. as a graduate student and I arrived in Habana and I found out that he was going to be on sabbatical leave uh, for the next year. <laughs> so that killed my interest in, <laughs> in personality and that led me basically into the area uh, particularly of, of, of training and I began to get interested in this literature that couldn't answer a basic question of what was the concept of the concept. Okay, all right. Um, so that really was uh, where, so a key point in my whole of my career, professional career, was the University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it changed my world view. Um, it opened me up uh, to uh, the whole area of technology at that time because it's a very good engineering school mm -hmm. um, and I uh, lived in an independent house with students from, who were in engineering so I, I, I developed that sort of interest um, and a lot of the work that I subsequently did whilst I was uh, active in uh, IST here at the University of Illinois uh, was as a consultant uh, for major uh, American companies, the most important of which in my career was the 20 years that I spent as a senior consultant with General Electric, mm -hmm. which was an application of everything that I did. Mm -hmm. But they, I never used the words instructional systems technology because I never have thought that it was a useful label and was a dangerous label in terms of how people would perceive who we were and what we were and I did, not ne see, ne I did not want to have that, uh, to be rather cruel, as a mark of Cain on my forehead. So I either define myself as a psychologist um, or I define myself uh, as someone interested, when I was active in IST, uh, in the area of human performance technology. Mm -hmm. which I define the technology pieces simply as know-how and nothing to do with hardware or technology mm -hmm. in the technology sense of the term as we use it even mm -hmm. today. Sure, okay. Um, over the years, I know you've seen a lot of trends, a lot of fads come and go in the field, but what are a couple of the major changes you saw that had a, a significant impact on our field or on other fields that we might affect? Well, let's go from one end to the other end, okay. the whole continuum. Let's look mm -hmm. at the where, and then there's been a journey in between, but I think th the journey is less interesting mm -hmm. than where it began. Mm -hmm. It began with photographs and with drawings, mm -hmm. graphics. Mm -hmm. Harvey Fry was a good area, and, and Mac Fleming uh, was a good area where that all began. Mm -hmm. And 
Today, uh, our, um, the area which we're describing and talking about, which is much bigger than IST here, is to be best to be seen in the name changes that are taking place in departments of psychology. Mm -hmm. Department which I think gives you an idea of just how far we've moved and the enormity now of the new possibilities that are open to us. And this is the names of the most important departments of psychology are some variant of this. Uh, Department of Brain and Psychological Sciences. MRI mm -hmm. and the ability to see what is happening in the brain has transformed research mm -hmm. in our area, mm -hmm. everybody's area. How do you think that will impact our field? I'd be very interested to see if it does. <laughs> okay. Um, and the caution that's in that uh, remark of mine is simply, of course, the size of the investment mm -hmm. uh, in order to get time on MRI, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of whether you purchase an MRI. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, prices are going down and things do change. Um, but it requires an, an add-on to training of people in our field mm -hmm. in order to start opening up that area. But that area of being able to see what's going on this moment mm -hmm. in terms of learning acquisition mm -hmm. um, is where the future lies. Mm -hmm. So in a, in, a, in a sense, instructional systems technology, I hate the limitation to instruction. Um, uh, systems is a very rich term. I uh, like it much more. Systemic is much, much, much more interesting than systematic. Mm -hmm. Though much of our literature is heavily systematic. Mm -hmm. uh, just look at the graphics in the articles mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. just how systematic they are. And how they've even changed over the years, yes. from what we know. Yes. I think it's a, a, a worthy study uh, would be some time of looking at dissertations uh, in our field in p terms of just the graphics uh, that they've used and the design even just of the tables that are used mm -hmm. within the dissertations oh, yeah. over a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, I once got a, had a student uh, do a very s small version of what we're talking about. Um, I, a day or before he died gave me uh, all the editions uh, of his books, a book on audiovisual. Mm -hmm. um, and I, they re basically comes down to four complete editions. Mm -hmm. Edition one it is the earliest one to edition four. Mm -hmm. I have them on the shelf uh, on my office mm -hmm. uh, to this day. Not quite certain what I should do with them. <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> what I asked the student to do, he was a graduate student, uh, was to find out what were the differences between the editions. Mm -hmm. Now there are obvious differences. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the major differences, the books got thicker. And of course, the photographs were changed because Dale wanted to get it adopted as a textbook. Mm -hmm. And so textbook committees require to have a modern version uh, of a Ford car, uh, not something that's uh, <laughs> seven or ten years old. Um, mm -hmm. So photographs and drawings were changed. But the best representation of Dale's contribution to the field in terms of the cone of experience is in edition one. All the extra texts were like barnacles on a ship. They interfered with the message. Mm -hmm. They were added, presumably, because he thought it was a better explication of the message. Mm -hmm. But the message is its clearest and in its beautiful form. It has elegance in, in the earliest edition and the elegance is lost in edition form. I see. Very interesting. Uh, your career is... It, I see some common themes coming through it. I wonder if you could tell us some of the uh, major ideas or approaches that have influenced your career and some of the people that have influenced your uh, uh, career. Well, we mentioned B.F. Skinner. Mm -hmm. uh, B.F. Skinner intrigued me greatly um, because initially he promised uh, a, a, a science of learning. Mm -hmm. And the idea of that, the concept of that, the, the richness of that, whether we delivered or not, was, was intriguing, mm -hmm. to apply science to. It was the same sort 
of battle that he was fighting that we have in terms of climate. Mm -hmm. Because now we talk about the science of climate change. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're trying to get brownie points and authority <laughs> and credibility because you're talking, it has a science side. And so the, a science of learning, a science of teaching, mm -hmm. which is what he was talking about, was very attractive. Um, and he was a very attractive a man in terms of how he spoke. Um, he was, had become, in the time that I knew him, as I say, still casually, uh, a philosopher uh, of psychology, and mm -hmm. particularly a, a philosopher of this science. Mm -hmm. And I saw a very interesting event take place, which always intrigued me. And he was invited to give a lecture to the uh, Royal Society um, in London. And now the Royal Society is the most distinguished society for scientists, uh, uh, certainly in Europe and probably to an extent in the world. To get an FRS, a Fellowship of the Royal Society, is really something. Uh, it was founded in 1665, so it's been around a long time. <laughs> um, and you're invited to become a member. And it's, the, it's a, if you like, it's a, a substitute for a Nobel Prize. So these are really the princes of physics, engineering. Mm -hmm. um, there's no educa um, it's only in the last few years that a psychologist has ever become. Mm -hmm. A member, and he was invited to give this lecture, and I, for some whatever reason, I was invited to go along uh, in the audience, which was a great occasion. You know. <laughs> uh, so I sat there, and here was one of my heroes, uh, B.F. Skinner, um, and I had recently uh, spoken to him again in the States, and um, he was a disaster. And it must have been a very humbling experience for him. What had happened? He'd underestimated his audience. Mm. He hadn't realized that they could get what he was saying from the first sentence in his paragraph. Mm. He didn't need <coughs> the other sentences in the paragraph. <laughs> that was a turning point. Mm -hmm. um, because a little while afterwards, I uh, was doing some work uh, on assignment, um, and I was here at, um, at, uh, uh, that, um, that uh, in, in South Africa. And during the course I was in South Africa, uh, a friend of mine said, uh, we've got a guest coming, uh, uh, she's an American, and we're going to, we would like to take her out to Bryanson Country Club in Johannesburg. Uh, for um, a Saturday uh, supper glance. Uh, we'd like you to come along. And I didn't feel comfortable with that, you know, dancing with my arm around her waist, what would my wife think, you know, and <laughs> would she be happy about this, and uh, who was this woman, you know, and things like this. Her name was Marion Kellogg. Uh, another keystone in my life, because she introduced me to probably the most important man I've ever met. Um, who really did redefine my life. Um, and so I was bullied into it. And so I went along and during the course of the evening and dancing, she said, what do you do? And all of these sort of things, I explained to her. And she says, you know, we have um, a young uh, senior executive um, in GE and um, he has a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Illinois and you roughly overlap. Did you know him? And I didn't know him, uh, but I knew his major professor, as it turned out. Um, and um, she says, uh, he has a product, a project, uh, product, but with no applications. We're looking for, uh, for, to help him, because if he doesn't get any applications, his career is going to be very limited. <laughs> this is, this, the research and development that's taken place has been very, very costly. Um, and um, so I said, well, yeah, yeah, sounds interesting. Um, and she put me in touch with him. Um, this young man, she said, now, it's going to be difficult for you because he's very bright, he's very impatient, and when you talk to him, um, make certain your paragraphs are short 
because you'll get the point in the first sentence. It wasn't that, that was <laughs> history repeating itself. I mean, <laughs> I mean, she, she sold her case immediately, but it put me on my guard. Mm -hmm. And that man was Jack Welsh. And off and on over the uh, 20 years, I worked on different projects within GE, some directly for him, some projects that he was interested in, some mm -hmm. nothing to do with him, that he was always interested in them. And that was exactly Welsh. And Welsh taught me uh, business. I sometimes officially say uh, my MBA uh, came from Welsh. <laughs> Um, and so for 20 years I uh, joined the time uh, before he became uh, chairman and CEO until the days that he was chairman and, and one of the, the biggest projects that I had which again is a psychologist and the concept, the, the importance of concept acquisition uh, the importance um, of seeing how people learn or, and retain and how people can lose and ch be changed themselves came from a project that I w did for him which was involved with workout a process that's well known in the literature but my responsibility was to change um, GE's uh, industrial businesses that was uh, power systems, mm -hmm. uh, motors um, from being a company, an American company that was selling offshore to a global company. And I said, well, how would you know when I'm successful? He said, when I look at the organization chart and see no evidence of Americanisms, even down to the names, mm -hmm. as well as the geographical locations. And so for five years, I was responsible for changing the culture of the old Edison businesses, mm -hmm. all for the most part located I, uh, in uh, Schenectady, mm -hmm. the old Northwest home of industry and the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. in the United States. And subsequently, the other defining moment came when I was asked, after some work that I'd done in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, to change, to lead uh, a group of economists uh, to change the economic base of the kingdom which took another five years and which is now bearing fruit mm -hmm. in terms of what's happening. So change became a very important part of this. Mm -hmm. um, interesting enough in terms of people, a man who was responsible uh, for me uh, getting involved in Saudi Arabia and things is a man called Bill Carson, uh, who I've never met. Um, I have spoken to once on the telephone, uh, but he has sold me <laughs> uh, to uh, a number of people, uh, and one of them um, was uh, a Saudi Arabian person uh, who became, as it were, my sponsor in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so we've got Bill Carson, we've got Welsh, Jack Welsh. Um, and we've got B.F. Skinner. What a mix. <laughs> what a mix. Um, people peripherally who have had an important part uh, have been Wittgenstein. I'm interested in philosophy and Wittgenstein mm -hmm. has always intrigued me, uh, particularly his blue books in which he deals with beauty. I'm very interested in design, mm -hmm. uh, how things fit together, how the concepts emerge. Mm -hmm. uh, how, if you, you, you want. And I've sort of practiced that uh, in the house, the house has made it in there. We have, we have, the, we built the house when we came to the United States, but we couldn't afford much, so we've added uh, onto it over the years. And uh, I designed all those major changes myself. Interesting. And did a contract and used a contractor uh, mm -hmm. to actually carry out the work. And I, will be, I, also acted in those changes, which is again the insight. Uh, that I was the project manager. I managed them. Every morning I met with the work people, checked what they were doing, would make changes if necessary, mm -hmm. uh, but I ran it. So I learned very early on the importance of execution. And I learned that from a man called Larry Bossidy, who used to be a, a, a senior um, 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 part of the, um, uh, the, the executive staff of um, General Electric and became a deputy chairman one time, 
before he moved to Honeywell. Um, and the importance of getting things done, mm -hmm. just the simple importance of getting things done. Very interesting. Bob Lerner, who was one of the uh, enduring photographers for Look Magazine, yes. made a statement to me a year ago that a photographer is known for one photograph. He joked that he could have retired early because mm -hmm. he took that one photograph. As a scholar in the field, and well, multiple fields now, what one contribution do you think you're best known for? Well, let me say, uh, I want to preface it because you the photograph. Uh, one of the major f um, people in IST um, was uh, Warren Stevens, mm -hmm. who was a photographer, a photog uh, photographer photo extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. And I once made a remark to him, seeing a photograph of his, mm -hmm. that that summed up everything that he was and everything that he is. Mm -hmm. he, at that time he was alive. Uh, after he died, almost immediately after he died, uh, his daughter gave me that photograph, which hangs in my office uh, in, uh, in IST. Which one is it? Uh, it's a photograph uh, of a sky and a sand. Uh, you could also say sea, mm -hmm. but it's, it's the meeting of these okay. two. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just extraordinarily riveting, mm -hmm. and yet, if you uh, wanted to be cruel, you would say it's quite flat meaning that unless you look very carefully, mm -hmm. it looks like different shades of, of, of black and white. It's mm -hmm. black and white. Mm -hmm. um, but an immaculate focus, a perfect uh, focus. It, 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 that's it. And that's a, that was something that I learned from Warren Stevens, was just that simple word, focus is everything. I loved how he would get out students, um, he'd give them a negative and say, come up now with prints. And, that, and he said, I, I want them dripping. I don't want them dried or anything like this. And so they'd come out with a clutch of some five different prints. Mm -hmm. And he would stand there and he, uh, he would give them a seminar, just them, mm -hmm. as they, they had these little prints on their hair. And he would say, now why is this better than that? Why is this unsuccessful, but he's got that wonderful little piece there? What does... And it would be about these wet, dripping things on the floor. It was an amazing act of instruction. Mm -hmm. It was an amazing act of getting people to see and compare the differences and similarities and the significance of those similarities mm -hmm. that coexisted in that, in that wet, soggy print. <laughs> Ripping on your shoes. <laughs> Ripping on your shoes and on the floor of Mitchell Hall. Mm -hmm. You remember Mitchell Hall, oh, I, an I, old I, farmhouse. I, I got many a critique from him. Uh, all right. <laughs> so you, you went through this. I went through it. That picture has no guts. <laughs> kind of funny, it, didn't, it wasn't dark enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of my picture and it has yes. no guts? <laughs> Uh, that was the, and, and Warren Stevens uh, was uh, the preface to... Well, the, the question was, what um, accomplishment in your career do you think you're best known for? Besides one of your photographs now. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not a good pho photographer. I just take photographs. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, best known for, um, because it got me the fellowship of the British Psychological Society mm -hmm. uh, for um, uh, contributions to the theory and practice of psychology. So it had mm -hmm. to have something, mm -hmm. and I didn't offer it them. <laughs> 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 I mean, I wasn't asked to send in, you know, mm -hmm. good, my best works or mm -hmm. anything like that. Um, uh, and that was uh, matrix analysis, mm -hmm. um, which is a technique of actually mapping the uh, the, uh, the, the cognitive structures mm -hmm. uh, of materials mm -hmm. and being able then to determine what appropriate instructional strategies there are for each one of these structures, mm -hmm. all of which are nested one within another, not mm -hmm. just serial but three-dimensionally. Um, that was, uh, and that was used by NASA uh, to analyze some of the dramatic moments that took place in mm -hmm. NASA history, um, so the, the applications of that. Uh, so I, I, I think, for as a psychologist, that's what people would remember. I think that um, the uh, three articles, one article 
is a theory of advice which appeared in Instructional Science, which has been reprinted any number of times, including bo um, books, of collections of mm -hmm. publications in our field, uh, um, which looks at how do we give advice, who owns advice, mm -hmm. and do you take advice, and what are the models behind different theories of advice, um, which I wrote um, on the basis of a presentation that I was going to give to AECT many years ago and at the last moment was unable to go and very reluctantly they agreed uh, for it to be done by means of video mm -hmm. and on that video led me to write the article for instructional science. Uh, the, the important thing about articles for instructional science is they asked you for the articles and it, they had to be a minimum of 25 published pages. Mm -hmm. So, so it, was a, it, it was a heavy piece of work. But anyway, and uh, I still, I'm still quite happy with, with that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, uh, the review of the literature uh, that Jim Hartley and I did of advanced organizers, mm -hmm. uh, which got me into great trouble uh, with the uh, originator of advanced <laughs> organizers <laughs> who believed I was I being just that. nasty <laughs> to him and mm -hmm. his publications. Um, David Ossabel. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't, it was just a, li uh, it was a, a literature mm -hmm. of advanced organizers. Is that, is that the one on pre-instructional strategies yes. and are? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And part of that I republish as a chapter in one of my, one of my books. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, the, bo uh, the, uh, the bo uh, book that I, uh, the um, management of learning uh, was the f my f first real book. I'd written two books before that with other people. Um, uh, was uh, written uh, and um, Bob Mega wrote the introduction to that. And the book came out of uh, an introduction that I wrote for one of Mega's books. Mega and I worked together we should include him in all of this mm -hmm. uh, because we wrote, we w actually physically w uh, worked for at the same time, he, he was director of research, uh, uh, for a company in Paris and he lived in Paris for a period during this time. So we worked very closely over that time mm -hmm. and um, on one overseas trip um, that he made returning uh, to London uh, with a duty-free bottle of gin, um, he and I wrote an article on the importance of footnotes in professional literature, which has been published in a number of places, uh -huh. which is semi-humorous, mm -hmm. and you can smell the, uh, the gin <laughs> in the article. Uh, uh, um, and it was uh, about, you know, you only find footnotes in the very best literature. That's how you can tell they're refereed. <laughs> uh, uh, footnotes are always at the bottom of the page because um, you put a number in the middle of the page and you see that number and the eye goes right down to the bottom of the page. And in the article, it's got down in the footnote, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the article, so the whole thing, so it, it was a, a semi-drunken article that there was, <laughs> had no difficulty getting it published. <laughs> um, the, um, and the, so that was an important book. But in terms of contribution, uh, the McGraw-Hill book on objectives was very important. And somebody, walked, one of my students many years ago, walked off of my copy. All right then. It's still available <laughs> uh, and uh, you can, most available at all in Amazon used books. <laughs> um, because it opened up the field of objectives, it dealt with advanced organizers, it dealt mm -hmm. with introductions, uh, it mm -hmm. dealt with all kinds of things that, in which one got a sense of direction mm -hmm. as well as being told directly mm -hmm. by a, a, a behavioral goal mm -hmm. or a beha behavioral statement. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. even down uh, to um, a, a, a pe uh, uh, executive summaries um, and to conclusions to mm -hmm. things as being areas in which you get direction. Mm -hmm. And the direction can often be 
not in, out of alignment with what you get at the beginning, with mm. what you get at the end, and appropriately out of alignment because you've made a journey between the two. Mm -hmm. So where you start off isn't necessarily where you necessarily have to finish, mm -hmm. but you, st you attract somebody on a journey uh, so what you say at the very early part, mm -hmm. uh, they were then amazed, you mean, yeah, these takeaways weren't what I imagined, <laughs> <laughs> where were we going to go with this? Um, so I think um, the uh, uh, management of learning, which in America the edition is the same, the title's different, it's competence-based learning, mm -hmm. um, and uh, behaviours, um, the, um, the article, uh, with Jim, pre-instructional strategies, um, and a theory of advice would be things that I'd still be proud of because uh, the, uh, I see them parts being still quoted, uh, they're still being reprinted um, by other people as in terms of collections. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, th they're articles that have stood the, the time. Yeah, we started your matrix analysis oh, maybe three years ago in an article. Ah, right. doing. Yes. So it's still alive. One last question. What sage advice would you give a new person just starting our field as a fact member today? I think that you have to recognize that we uh, that paradigms change. And our field defined by as as an exemplar IST at Indiana University, as well as the field in Florida State and elsewhere, um, is awaiting a new paradigm shift. Very good. And it's timely mm -hmm. because the, the changes that are happening within technology and the problems that education and training face are so enormous that something has to happen and hopefully it will happen in universities mm -hmm. um, who have got the time to be able to think about what is the next part of the story. It's a story that hasn't been completely told. It's a story that's impatient for not a reinvention but a complete break with the past and a new beginning. Very good. Well, thank you very much for your time and sharing your thoughts with us. It's most appreciated. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you.